Carol Ann. <laughs> y'all, are, y'all are one flesh, right? Yeah. One flesh. <laughs> Carol Ann, thank you. Randy and Ed, thank y'all for leading worship this morning. Uh, pray with me one more time. Father, we thank you for who you are, and Lord, we ask for your help in this time. God, we believe in the Holy Spirit, and we know that it's the Holy Spirit who gives us understanding of your word and points it all back to your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray not only that you would teach us this morning, um, make us more informed and and lead us to more and more worship and thankfulness of, of who you are, but Lord, I also pray for anyone in this room or joining us online who doesn't know Christ. Lord, I uh, Lord, I know that it's 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 hard to live life um, without Christ. Lord, it, it's impossible to live a life glorifying to you without Christ. And Lord, I, I pray that anyone who doesn't know you, God, that they that you would make yourself known to them, that you would show them how good you are, how holy, how beautiful, how full of love and mercy and faithfulness you are. And God, I pray that they would see a God who promises to punish sin, but also a God who punished His own Son on behalf of us, God. And so, Lord, in that, in that good news, in what Jesus did for us, we can have life. We can truly have a clean account. Our sins not counted against us. And Lord, we can actually come before you boldly. There's no condemnation for us who are in Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, I pray that anyone here would see their need for, for Jesus Christ. And Lord, once again, please teach us from your word. We desire to hear from you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know about you, but there, there have been times in my life, um, especially before I came to know Christ, um, where... I felt like no matter where I went, even in the context of my own family or at school among my normal friends, I felt like I didn't belong. I felt like I was kind of floating through life, floating through without a purpose, uh, even though I was in a, in a certain room with certain people, I didn't really feel like I was there. I just didn't feel like I belonged to anything or anyone. And I'll tell you, once I came to know Christ, that was one of the best things about knowing Him. Yes, He takes away my sin, He forgives my sin, but He brings me into fellowship with Himself. That I get to know the God of the universe, and that I'll never be separated from Him. It's one of the best feelings, best hopes in the world. And further than that, the Scriptures teach us that All who believe in Jesus Christ are one with Him, and that means you are one with each other. And so not only when you come to faith, and and for me personally, when I came to faith, I now have this relationship with the, the living God. What an amazing thing. But I also have a relationship, a deep relationship with people that maybe I have so many differences with in life, and without Christ, I would probably never spend time with them. But in Christ, I have a deeper connection with them than I do anyone else. And so what a marvelous mystery that is. Being a part of the body of Christ. It's been one of the greatest blessings and privileges that I've ever experienced here on this earth. And I hope you know that yourself from your own experience if you're a Christian. And the way we experience this is in the context of a local gathering of believers called a local church, like what we're doing today. But at the same time, I've also experienced quite a bit of discouragement and disappointment and even heartbreak in the context of a local church. And so I'm sure if you've been a Christian For any amount of time, you've experienced some of those same things. And so when we come to church on Sunday mornings, when we experience both the joy and blessings of being part of the body of Christ, but also some of the discouragement 
and the disappointment and, and even heartbreak. How are we to process this? How are we to act? How are we to respond? How are, to, how are we to view these things? What is the church? Why would we come on a Sunday morning? Why are we here? <laughs> how is the gospel connected to what we do here every morning or every Sunday morning? So most importantly, what does God tell us about the church? What has God said about the church? Both being united to Christ spiritually and to each other spiritually, all who are believers in Jesus Christ, but also the local expression of that. When we come together on a Sunday morning, what has God said about that? And how do we navigate difficulties when they come? How do we grow together as one church? And how should we relate to one another? We're going to begin to answer those today in Ephesians chapter 4. We started that as well last week in verses 1 and 2, uh, but we will continue to answer that this week. Uh, just as a reminder, last week in Ephesians 4, 1 and 2, Paul says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, and that's where we ended up. Basically, Paul's saying because of this type of salvation, the type of salvation God has given you, this should lead all of you to be humble and patient and gentle with each other. And as we talked about in small group last week, you got to put up with the other person, right? you got to bear with them. Easier said than done. But we also talked about how the book of Ephesians is divided in Scripture. It's very helpful. Generally speaking, chapters 1 through 3 tell us who God is and what He's done for all those who have trusted in Jesus Christ. It's this great list of thing after thing of what God has done for us. All the spiritual blessings that unfold into your life because of Jesus. And then chapters 4 through 6 generally tell us, okay, well, this has how it affects your life, your day-to-day -day living. If this is God, if this is who God is, if this is your salvation, then here's how you should live. This is how your relationships should go, right? But we also talked about in verse 1 of chapter 4, even though that's kind of more in the application section, okay, this is how your life should go. We talked about how Paul uh, mentions that... This is your calling. You're to walk worthy of your calling in which you were called. And so, really, as you live your life, the good news of what God has done for you should always be in view. Whether you're thinking about your relationship to your, your spouse, or how you view school, or work, or money, or children, whatever it may be, what's always in view is who is God? And what has He done for me? Who am I in Christ? What is my identity? And so he says to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. And so the natural question there is, well, what has God called us to? Paul doesn't define it right there, but he does define it in chapter 1. In chapter 1, verse 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And then he goes on to say, because of Jesus Christ, God shows us. He made us holy. He predestined us for adoption into his family to glorify him. He redeemed us. He forgives us. He gives us an inheritance. And he seals us with the Holy Spirit as a guarantee that God will finish what he started. So thing after thing that God has done for us in Jesus Christ, it should leave us with an attitude of God has given me everything in spite of what I deserve for my sins. God gave me the complete opposite of what I deserve for my wicked heart. And God, more than that, God changed my heart. He gave me a new name. He adopted me into His family. He gave me a Lord and Savior in Jesus Christ. 
And it says that Jesus Christ perfectly and powerfully holds our lives at each moment and will complete what he started in us. And so that should bring us to an attitude as as how Paul starts and ends chapters 1 through 3. Worship. It's not you just need to know who God is. It's you need to stand in awe of who God is. And part of that is knowing. But you need to be thankful. You need to stand in awe of him. And just another note, every scripture in the Bible, every passage in the Bible points to Jesus Christ, but every passage in the Bible also points to an invitation to know Jesus Christ. These things that we read about in the book of Ephesians, they're not automatically true of you if you just read them. They're not automatically true of you just because you're here this morning or because you've grown up in church or because your family is Christian, or because you think it sounds nice and assume it's true for you. Again, we have to let God do the talking here. What does God say about this? The Bible tells us that before these things can be true of you, you have to repent. You have to despair of yourself. In other words, the way I'm going with my life, with me as the authority, with me loving my own sin, cannot continue if I want to know this Jesus. I have to leave it all. I have to despair of myself and come to God with nothing, asking Him to save me. So you have to leave your sin. You have to trust what Jesus has done for you to make you right with God. Nothing you can do can bring you into right standing with God. Only what Jesus has done Right, No amount of rule-keeping or willpower can make you clean before God. Only by the blood of Jesus Christ can you be made whiter than snow. Only Jesus Christ will do. And so Paul says, walk worthy of your calling. So that's your calling. That's what God has called you to. That's what God has given you, right? And so he says, okay, now walk in a way that's suitable to what God has done for you. Walk like God has actually done this for you, right? Live as if God is who He is and He's done this for you. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. So here Paul takes a very specific route with walking worthy. See, the Christian life is not designed for you to do it on your own. Paul is assuming here, and he'll explain it further, that as soon as you are joined to Christ, you are joined with other people who believe in Christ. And so naturally, that means if the gospel is true and God is who he says he is, then it's going to manifest in certain ways that we relate to one another that are against what the world normally does. And it's an evidence that God has worked a miracle in your heart and changed your heart. So we, ref- we, we study, we reflected on these verses last week to find that humility, uh, boasting in Christ and, and being for the good of those around you, um, that's the essence of humility and gentleness. You're not putting yourself down, you're not putting others down, but you're boasting in Christ. You're pointing people to Christ. That's what humility is. And Christ modeled that perfectly as well. We also talked about how important it is to treat others with Christ's patient, enduring love that bears up even when people are trying to get under your skin. Right? That phrase, don't poke the bear. Don't poke the bear. (laughs) Well, you shouldn't be a bear. Right? (laughs) If you're a Christian, you shouldn't be the bear. Okay? But we have to treat others this way with Christ's patient, enduring love that bears up even when provoked or sinned against. The same love that Christ showed us is the same love we're called to show each other, right? And not what we think they deserve or how we feel like treating them, right? Last, we also talked about putting up with or or bearing with the people around us who are believers and and how this is part of that life lived in a worthy way of our calling. 
God is not done with us as believers. Right? This, this is not the finished product. Right? We all be in a heap of trouble if it was. We know from Scripture that even now God is maturing us. God is graciously and patiently teaching us, leading us, and guiding us to put sin to death in our life and to pursue righteousness. And so sometimes that gets really difficult. Sometimes that gets kind of hairy. <laughs> but it's also a beautiful and joyful process. And so he says, bear with one another as this happens. Be patient with one another in love. As this happens, and then lastly, we come to our passage today, verse 3, part of walking worthy of your calling in Christ, he says, is to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And then he goes on to explain a little bit more that unity. He says there's one body. There's one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So in light of our salvation, in light of who God is, right, chapters 1 through 3, we are to work to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Why? Because there's only one body of believers in Jesus Christ, right? There's only one Jesus, right? That's why we have all the ones after that. So first he says in this last description of a believer walking worthy of their calling is that we should all be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So this word eager, it's an ongoing action. Another translation is to make every effort. So to follow God's command here requires diligence, effort, and initiative. Of course, in His strength always. But it requires those things. To do what? It says to maintain the unity of the Spirit. Another translation is to guard or keep the unity of the Spirit. And so what we see very clearly in these verses is that if you've trusted in Jesus Christ, we know this, you become one with Him. And you also become one with other believers, no matter how different they are. One of the biggest differences in their day was between Jew and Gentile, and many people thought these were irreconcilable differences. No, Paul says, Jesus says, you are now friends in Christ. You're no longer enemies. Just like I'm not your enemy anymore, you're not enemies with each other. But here's something very important here. He says, you have the perfect unity of the Spirit with each other. And so now what is proper to your calling is to act like it, is to guard it, is to keep it. See, no human being can create unity. Despite what the world says and all the world's efforts to create unity, they, they, they all fail. Think about it. Has there ever been a treaty in history that you read about in history books that has been kept? <laughs> so no human creates unity. No group of humans called a local church even creates unity. God is not calling us here today to create unity and then keep it and preserve it. The calling is to maintain it, to guard it, to keep it. Christ takes us into himself, unto himself, and makes us one with himself and other believers. And so we are to live in light of that reality. So our, when we look around in the day-to-day, -day, are there things that disrupt enjoying that unity that we have with each other? Absolutely. Absolutely. Right? Are, are there people, are there unbelievers in local churches 
who think they know Christ and, and, they, and they really don't, and that causes issues sometimes. Yes. Are we to try to sort them out? No. Are, are Christians capable of being divisive and, and doing things to each other that leave scars and trauma? Yes. But does any of that change that Jesus is the one who creates and ultimately maintains this true unity with himself and with other believers? No. So we are called to be eager to make every effort to maintain, guard, keep the fact that we are now one with God and one with each other through Jesus Christ. The Spirit is sent to live in us, and it says, in the bond of peace. So what should bind us all up together is peace. And of course, we start with God. When God saves a sinner, peace is made between those two parties who were formerly at war. That's what God does for each individual in the gospel. Peace is made between you and a holy God because of what Jesus did. There's now nothing between you and God. And so then by definition, you are at peace with the rest of his children. So peace with God and then each other, manifested by the presence of the Holy Spirit, is what binds us all together. So then he goes through all these descriptions of this unity, saying one body and one spirit. And if you look back a few chapters in, in Ephesians chapter 2, it follows the same order. Paul says, one body, one spirit, in verses 16 through 18. In verse 16, it says that Jesus reconciles us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So you have body and spirit there. He's talking about Jew and Gentile, but the reference is clear. So if there's now peace between you and God and your Lord is now Jesus Christ, then whatever your differences are with other people, Paul's saying you're one in Christ and that's a beautiful thing. So if there's one body and one spirit, then all these divisions and differences that you might have or make, uh, make much of, you need to view it in terms of, of who God is. He says, one Lord. Paul says there's truly only one Lord. Right? There's not multiple Lords. There's not multiple Jesuses. He says, we look to Him. We are one in Him. Right? His holiness and authority and oneness are what override our differences and put down divisions. He says, we have one faith. In the book of Jude, Jude tells us that we have a common salvation and there's a faith once for all delivered to the saints, right? Our, our faith doesn't change and there's not multiple faiths in Jesus Christ. It doesn't change with the times or with the politics, right? Or, or with ever-changing views on, on gender and sexuality. There's a permanence to who Jesus is, right? And the faith that we have. Our faith is in Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He doesn't change with the times, and he's no respecter of persons. The ones who look in faith to Jesus will be the ones who will be made perfectly like him when he comes back, the book of 1 John tells us. So we have one faith. We also have one baptism, Paul says. What sort of baptism do we have? Well, Matthew tells us in the Great Commission that we're baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, right? Baptism as a word, it means immersion. If you're to put something all the way under the water, it's immersion. You're being fully soaked or fully covered by the water. So we take that same imagery and see that we are baptized in the name of God, in the name of each person of the Trinity. So we are immersed with God. We are saturated fully with who God is and what He's done. 
And Paul gives this full concept in Galatians 3, verse 26. He says, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And then he says, One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. And so Paul ends it with one more powerful statement of the unity that we have with each other. No matter how different you are with the next believer who's sitting the row back from you or, or sitting beside you, no matter how different you are, God is the Father of you both. And doesn't that trump any difference you might have? Right? So again, we ask the question, why does he list all these ones? <laughs> If you think about it, if you look at the world, if you look at the news, right, we are characterized by our conflict, <laughs> right? We can find the even most petty of things to divide over. It doesn't take much, right? <laughs> if you have small ch kids in the home, you know that. <laughs> but us adults, I mean, we're not that much different, right? We get a little better at hiding it or rationalizing it, but it... The temptation, the natural human thing, is to divide and to make differences with each other. Think about how easy it is in the world to get two people to hate each other. Right? One little argument, one little word, maybe not even a word, maybe just a look. Right? <laughs> Sometimes body language tells it all. And you amplify that. How easy is it to get two groups of people or two countries to hate each other and to keep that going? Right? It's not, it's not hard at all. The hard thing is stopping it once it's going, right? Paul says through the gospel, Jesus has conquered this and is conquering it, this part of sinful man. Us dividing and hating each other. This is God's answer to this, this, this evilness and, and, and sadness in the world because of differences and hating each other. You can be one with God and you can be one in Christ. For every person that God has redeemed individually, Paul wants us to know that he has added to his one family in Jesus Christ. And think about this. Your identity does not stem from anything in the world anymore. Anything in the world or the world's values or value system or any of the reasons why people look down on each other. Your identity is not in those things anymore. In all the ways the world would divide itself based on skin color or job or or, or beliefs, or where you grew up, or if you're rich or poor, if you're Jew or Gentile, Texan or not, right? <laughs> American or not, blue collar or white collar, new Christian or you've been a Christian for a while. The Bible has one term for you to use for another Christian, and it's simply brother in Christ, sister in Christ. That's it. And so this is yet another reminder that you need to know in whom you believe and what he did for you more and more. That's what both of Paul's prayers are focused on. And this should produce in you love, humility, gentleness, patience, a putting up with others, right? And an eagerness to guard or maintain or keep the unity you have in Christ. This is so radical. This is so unnatural for the world that you need to preserve it and have it shine like a light so they can see who Christ is based on how you love one another. So we know what this unity is. We, we know how it fits into walking worthy of our calling, always viewing the gospel, even in our day-to-day -day life. 
knowing that we don't create the unity, Jesus does. So now we have that basis. And so now I want to just address a few things that, that undermine or spoil that unity. We actually talked about this in small group last week, and I've been guilty of maybe not using this phrase, but for thinking this way. I think Tanya brought it up. It's, it's that phrase, well, I love them, but I don't like them. <laughs> I love them, but I don't like them. Right, we, did t- we talked about there is such a thing as healthy caution with people. Right, there is such a thing as healthy boundaries when we relate to other people. There is. But let me ask you this question. Does God ever treat you this way? Does God ever treat you that way? You wake up one morning and you're having a bad day and you're just kind of being not that great. (laughs) And God says to himself, well, I love him but I don't like them very much today. Does God ever treat us that way as a believer? No. Because think about it. If it worked that way, God is perfect. Right? He's not like us. He's perfect. If it worked that way, it would be every day, right? If we're really honest, it would be every day God would treat us that way. I love him, but I don't really like him right now. He's cold towards us. Every day. Think about this. Everything God does to you and in you is based on His love for you through the Son, through Jesus Christ. Even in allowing terrible suffering or discipline in your life, God's love is a jealous and fierce love like nothing you will ever experience. And the mentality of, I love them but don't like them, is not in God's vocabulary. Because he would never treat his son that way. And you're in his son. You're unified with his son. He would never treat you that way. Right? God would never give you the cold shoulder. Would he give his son the cold shoulder? He's his son, right? What does he say about his son? This is my son in whom I am well pleased. Did you know that is true about you as a believer? That God is well pleased in you. And that will never change. Because you are in Christ. God's love for you can only ever be good. And for your good and for His glory. Because God is perfectly good. And so if we take God for who He is and His love for us then here's how the thought process should go. And like I said, I've been guilty of this before. When we have this mentality like, okay, I'm just going to put up with this person. I don't like them very much. (laughs) Here's how that should go. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. I don't really like this person for reasons X, Y, and Z, or what they did in the past, or they just annoy, whatever, (laughs) right? But guess what? I'm not to love them based on what I think they deserve or how I feel at any given moment, but based on what God says to do and how God says to treat them. That's what I go by now. My life is not my own. I don't call the shots anymore. It's God's life. So it changes from I love them, but I don't really like them to simply Lord, I will love them and be for their good because that's what you call me to do. Please help me to do that. Think about it. John 13, Jesus tells us the same way that I have loved you, you are to love each other. There is no separate category. There's no separate standard of love for those you don't like or for those who annoy you. It's a hard one. (laughs) Here's another thing that might undermine unity. 
When you say something like, I- I'm praying for so-and-so and this is what's going on. And then you proceed to air someone's dirty laundry and gossip. <laughs> By all means, pray with and for people. And if it concerns other people, if it's not a sensitive prayer request or something going on in their life, then then sure, pray with others about it. We need to be a praying church. But guarding the unity that we have in Christ also means guarding the reputation and the walk of other believers, right? Not everything is meant to be shared with everybody. (laughs) And so use wisdom and discernment Build your brother or sister up in Christ. Build them up. Don't tear them down. Don't cast them in a bad light. The third thing I was reading through Philippians, and guess what Paul says in Philippians will hinder you from being pure and blameless in this dark world. Grumbling and arguing. (laughs) Maybe not quite what you expected. Um... Maybe that seems to us kind of like a little sin, maybe, like a little white lie. But when you think about it, the definition of grumbling is complaining, a whispering, grumbling talk in private. What were the Israelites doing in the desert, right? Every, every time something went wrong, right, they grumbled, right? They grumbled against Moses. They grumbled against the God who had taken them out of Egypt, Right? So this is not a little thing. It's very simple. If you have a complaint against someone, Colossians 3 says, take it to that person, right? Forgive them. Have them forgive you if you've done something, right? And then move on, (laughs) right? Don't hold it as a grudge. Don't be bitter. If it isn't an issue of sin, if it's just something you don't like or something you thought wasn't wise, then here's a novel idea, and I say this to myself too. Trust the Lord to work it out with that person. Trust the Lord to work it out with that person. So be far from complaining, having a a complaining attitude or an argumentative attitude or a judgmental, hypercritical attitude in how you view people. Instead, be thankful, prayerful, go to the right people about any concerns you have, and be for their good. Be for their good. And the fourth thing I was thinking through was wanting a fake unity based on the avoidance of all conflict. I think we've all been in settings, uh, whether it's, it's your family or extended family or, or at work, where things are just tense. No one's, no one's willing to bring any issues out into the open and maybe do what's necessary or what's healthy to address some things. And it's all kind of passive aggressive and just re- really tense. No, no one's willing to have the right sort of conversations in, in a uh, not a super emotional way. And so one of the key ways in Scripture to maintain a true unity in Christ and guard its purity is to actually go to another person when there is sin. If you see sin in their life and it's clear or they've done something against you or or, or you've done something against someone, the scriptures would say, don't just ignore it. Bring it. Bring it up with that person in a wise and loving way. Resolve it. Be honest with each other. Forgive as God has forgiven you. Work it out and then never bring it up again. And if it comes up in your mind, banish it from your mind. Don't let it affect how you treat that other person because it has been taken care of. So we think, when we think about doing this, oftentimes in our society, we, we, we start throwing up excuses. You know, it's going to be awkward. Uh, you know, maybe they're unwilling to see whatever it is I'm, I'm taking to them. Or, or maybe they're going to leave the church because... I'm going to bring this to their attention. And of course, you need to be wise about how you do this, right? You need to aim at love. You need to aim at restoration, right? And you need to be willing to receive someone when they come to you with something. But think about it. If we have a church 
And I don't think this is the case here. I'm just saying in general, but if we have a church where no one is willing to have those types of conversations that the scriptures tell us to have, then our relationships are all going to be one inch deep and not a, a good reflection of the unity that we have in Christ. And the fifth thing, and wait for me on this one, <laughs> the fifth thing is assuming that every person and every church and every denomination and every group is a part of our unity in Christ. But there's also a flip side to that, right? The flip side, the other ditch to fall into is assuming that we are the ones who have the truth, right? Thinking that the Baptist denomination has an embargo on truth, all right? Here at Oakville Baptist Church, right, we have the true interpretation of Scripture, Okay? There's, there's two ditches to fall into here. right? But like I said, on the other side, to assume that we are one in Christ with every church, every person, every group who vaguely talks about Jesus and use Christian terms, uses Christian terms, uh, that, that's foolish. Paul says in Philippians that one part of being loving and loving God is actually being able to discern between truth and error, true and falsehood. That's called discernment. And so discernment is needed when we interact with other groups and, and people and churches. That's not to assume the worst about everybody. That's just to use good discernment, to think with a scriptural lens. And it is true that God is bigger than a denomination, <laughs> right? God's denomination is not the Baptists. <laughs> but it is also true that people and groups believe some wacky stuff. <laughs> and we need to be knowledgeable about those things that some groups don't even claim to use the Bible as God's word. Right? They think it's man's word mixed with some, some good things about God or, or something like that. So we need to be aware of those things when we relate to people. And so without going into an endless amount of detail about all the different denominations we have, uh, the, the branches of Christianity, Orthodoxy, Protestantism, Catholicism, or even cults, okay, and how we would distinguish those, I want to tell you... Uh, this is how we start with discernment. This is how we start with distinguishing group from group. That all true believers come to God by grace through faith, as Ephesians 2 says, in Christ and for the glory of God alone. And how do we know who Christ is? And how do we know, or how do we come to be forgiven by God? And then how do we know what it means to live in light of that? There's only one standard. And it's right here. This is our standard, the Word of God. This is how we discern. This is how we love. This is how we judge rightly between beliefs and know what true unity is. So Paul tells us here to walk worthy of our calling, which is being saved by Jesus Christ, by grace through faith, along with many other people who we are now unified with as one body, and that goes across denominations, right? And this should result in humbleness, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love, and an eagerness to guard and protect the unity that we have in Jesus. So when we think about this, this family of God, I want to invite you into the family of God. And it's not me who's inviting you, it's, it's Jesus himself. You can be forgiven of your sins, all the things you've said and thought and the secret places of your mind and the things that you've done and how you've treated people. You can be forgiven, truly forgiven of all of those things and come into God's family, God's household, because of Jesus' work on the cross for you and his resurrection from the dead. That's what you trust. Not cleaning yourself up, 
Only His righteousness is enough. Only He is perfect. And so you come to Him with nothing. You depend on Him for everything. And you truly will receive everything, including Himself. And you will be joined together with Him and joined with the family of God. What a glorious thing that is. You'll be saved from hell, set free from sin, and also made into a new creation. That's the promise of God for all who would come to Him. So I want to invite you as we sing our last song, if you have something going on in your life that you'd like for me to pray for, um, come up to the front and I'll pray with you about those things. If you have any questions about what it means to know Christ and to be forgiven of sin, all the things we talked about, um, please uh, get with me on that as well. And let's uh, just respond to the Lord and His Word and sing unto Him. Let's pray. Father, we pray that we would honor you this morning and um, as we go from here, that we would go with the knowledge of, of who you are. And Lord, that uh, for all of us who are believers in Christ, that, that you are our Father and that we belong to one faith. We're one with one another. And God, is, sometimes it's very difficult as we rub shoulders with each other and, and have disagreements and arguments sometimes. And Sometimes there's sin between two people. God, those things can not be immediately enjoyable. But Lord, even in our uh, responding to those things and, and forgiving one another, Lord, all of it is an opportunity to show each other the same type of love that you have shown us in the gospel. And Lord, what a privilege to do as a church. God, though we stumble, we know that you are the one who holds us up and who has created that unity in the first place. And so, Lord, as we go from here, we ask for your help. We know we need it after reading this passage. And, uh, Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.